Welcome to Master the NEC, where we talk about the National Electrical Code, baby. Oh yeah! Sit back, put on those headphones, chill with your significant other, baby, and listen to the guru talk about the National Electrical Code. Let's go. What up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Master the NEC. My name is Paul Abernathy, your host, and welcome to the podcast. We're going to talk the National Electrical Code tonight, but more importantly, we're going to dig into the 2023 edition of the National Electrical Code, give you a little bit of insight into the introduction. That's right, Article 90, the introduction. So anytime you're working in the National Electrical Code, whether you're in the 2017, the 2020, the 2014, the 2011, 2008, whatever you're in, baby, you're going to actually need to understand the introduction. First of all, you got to know what the scope of the NEC is all about. You got to learn what is covered and learn about what's not covered. You got to know what the code's arranged. You need to understand about interpretation and, dude, we're going to cover it. We're going to cover it in this episode and we're going to kind of move through it. And we're going to give you some good information you can take with you to say, look, dude, I understand the National Electrical Code's intent. I understand this introduction. So don't be trying to get something by me, Mr. Inspector Man. I'm going to be learning about the code. So that's what we're going to do in this episode. Now, I will tell you, if you're in the 2020 edition of it, it's not going to be a significantly a lot of big differences in there. Same kind of intent. But again, I am kind of Moving fresh, I know people say, look, you, why are you doing the 2023? Because it's not adopted anywhere. It just came out. But dude, I like to be fresh. You know what I'm saying? I like to put out something that's uh, a little different. So we're going to use the 2023 edition in order to have this episode. So just sit back and listen. All right, we're going to start this journey off in everywhere that we usually start is in the scope. We need to know what the scope is of Article 90. What is the scope all about? It kind of tells us what Article 90 is all about. Now, that is kind of a little different than the way it was in the 2020 edition of the National Electrical Code, because in the 2020 edition, the scope was under 90.2, right? And under the 2023 edition, the scope is 90.1. And in the 2020 edition, under 90.1, it was called the purpose. And that had practical safeguarding and then, of course, adequacy. And then, of course, uh, relation to other uh, international standards. But it's, it's a little different now for the 2023 edition. And you're going to start to see that there are a lot of, of changes moving around that took place in the 2023. So, again, it's going to be imperative that you folks out there uh, really start embracing a lot of these changes. That way it doesn't get complicated for you. Uh, because, you know, 2023 shakes it up a little bit. Article 220 calculations, uh, same concept, same intent, but it kind of shakes it up a little bit, moves things around, adds additional tables, that moves them a little bit. So, you know, it's, it's like with anything. New code comes out, uh, we shake things up. No, it's not because the code panel members do it. It's because people like you and electricians out there submit these changes and they make sense and they start getting incorporated into the code and we move things around. And every time we change the code every couple of years, I mean, we learn things that we got wrong last time and we fix it this time and we make the flow a little bit better. And we learn about things we didn't know about and we get more experts on the committees and people submit things to the committee and we have debates on it and it starts to make sense and and we're trying to make the best code possible and every cycle 2020 was amazing and 2023 is is raising the bar it's amazing nfpa compiled everything together uh, that we went through with the code development process but again uh, there's a lot of people out there and i read this on social media a lot there's people that think that the code panel is what writes all these changes and that is totally false. You heard me. That is totally 
false. That is not what happens. The code panel massage it, make it sound technical to be in this book. If you submitted something that you substantiated it, you justified it, you explained it, but now it gets decodified into the code book, um, we just don't sit around writing this stuff. We ain't got that kind of time. Trust me. If you go look at the process, there's literally uh, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds, if not over 1,000 and 2,000 different, or even more. I don't know the numbers this cycle, to be honest with you. But they get submitted, and we have to review it. So every code panel has to review these things. And so it, it literally takes time to do that. But we would not have the time to sit there and just dream up all these potential changes. That's farthest thing from the truth. And anybody let you believe that, you know they know nothing about how the code panels work. I'm just saying. Anyway, you, you've heard that, that old story, right? It's, you know, anyway, they don't know what they're talking about. I'm just telling you right off the bat. All right, so some changes in the structure to Article 90. Me looking over, and I'll kind of tell you the changes. Uh, me looking over it, it looks like these are various substantive changes. They look very well. It brings a little more flow to Article 90, same as it's going to do throughout the code. Uh, so far, as we start to dig more in our analysis of the code, um, we're going to see where the subtle changes take place. Uh, but Article 90 is going to be light for us. It's going to be very easy. So we're going to kind of go over it. All right, so what's changed for the 2023 is that 90.1 is now the scope. In the 2020 edition, scope was under 90.2, and it was basically talking about what was covered and what was not covered in the NEC. Uh, that's going to be in here as well, but that's going to be uh, structured a little different. It's going to be under 90.2 in the 2023 edition. So what's the scope of this article? What is it to cover? Well, the scope is this article covers use and application, arrangement, and enforcement of the code. Uh, it also covers the expression of mandatory, permissive, and non-mandatory texts, okay, like shall be, shall not, things like that. It says, uh, provides guidance on the examination of equipment. That's absolutely correct. So we'll, we'll see that when we get there. Again, you've heard those things expressed by inspectors all the time. And again, it talks about wire planning and uses and expression of measurement. Okay, so you'll kind of see what we what we mean when we get into that. Okay, it's very light listening. So if you're you're cruising down the road, this is going to be light for you. But you do need to know the introduction. You have to be familiar with Article 90 to see how uh, the most important one is code arrangement, for example. How does chapter one, two, three, four, five, six, and seven play in the scheme when you have eight chapters and then tables and then informative annexes and you got to kind of know how things work. So we're going to kind of look at that a little bit and I'm going to try to convey this in a podcast so it's easy listening, right? All right. So that's what the scope is. We know what we're trying to cover in this article makes sense before it really wasn't that flowing we didn't know what is expected of this article it just kind of hodgepodge but now we know what's expected we know what we're going to cover so the very first one we get to is 90.2 which is uses use and application now 90.2 previously was the scope but the use and application was under 90.1 but it was kind of called the purpose. And what does that mean, the purpose? So it's kind of been retooled, and these are under use and application. Now, there's still an A, a B, and a C, but now we've added a D, and it looks like we've added an E and an F, all to 90.2. So we're going to cover a lot of these things, like the cover, not covered, by the NEC, adequacy, practical safeguarding. Uh, we're going to be mixing in the special permission. All of that's going to be lumped into 90.2. Okay, so it should be a little easier flow. So let's look at it. So the very first one in 90.2 is A, and that is called practical safeguarding. So the purpose of this code, what is this code? The National Electrical Code, NFPA 70, okay, is official the official NFPA document, we call it NFPA 70. It is the practical safeguarding of persons and property from the hazards arising from the use of electricity. This code is not intended 
as a design specification or as an instruction manual for the untrained person. That is so freaking important, folks. Um, this document is designed to safeguard of persons and property from the hazards that arise from the use of electricity. Okay? That, that's what its goal is. That's the practical safeguarding. It is not a design specification, although it's kind of more and more things get added and then it gives, there's a difference between uh, prescriptive methods and things like that. But at the, at the end of the day, it's really not a design manual. Okay. It's not for design specifications, although people that do specifications and design utilize the NEC, but that's not the intent of the NEC to be that main function. And it certainly isn't an instruction manual for the untrained person. I mean, we have a hard enough time understanding the National Electrical Code in itself rather than put this document in the hands of a DIYer. And if you've ever been over on TikTok or seen some of that stuff, there are so many DIYers giving advice on electrical and you got to cringe for a second, right? You got to sit there going, really? Did you just say that? Like I say, always question your sources when you know they're a DIY or, you know, God bless them. But at the end of the day, they're not code experts and chances are they don't understand how to really read the National Electrical Code. So it's not for the untrained person. You can't stick this code book in Harry homeowner's hand and they use this as an instruction manual uh, in order to do any wiring, things like that. You know, they, they call all the time and ask me things about it. I usually just steer away from answering the DIY stuff for people, especially ones that call them like, dude, hire an electrician. Hey, you know, I'm not going to take the risk of you thinking that this code book is going to teach you everything you need to know. No, you have to have the hands on. You have to have the physical part before you start dabbling in the mental part. And the National Electrical Code to me, and you've heard me talk about this, um, the National Electrical Code is the mental part. The physical part is what you do every day. You learn your skill. You hone your craft. You're doing code whether you like it or not. You're securing things, supporting things, terminating things, leaving a certain amount of free conductor. You're doing these things because you've done it every day, right? That's mental. That ends up being embossed in your brain. But the National Electrical Code is really the mental part. You're just doing it because you do it every day repetitious. And that physical aspect of it, you just get used to doing it. You, the mental's there, but it's not as honed as it could be if you really do a healthy understanding of the National Electrical Code. Of course, you've heard me talk about that when it comes to CMECP, Certified Master Electrical Code Professionals. Uh, those are master electricians, but now I'm striving to take their game to the next level. I'm trying to hone their mental aspect. Help them better understand the NEC, that type of thing. Just going to make them more well-rounded and stand out amongst the crowd. That's what we're all about, okay? That's what that program's all about. All right, so that was A, uh, practical safeguarding. Now, B is adequacy. Now, in the 2020 edition, that was under 90.1B, but here it's under 90.2B. And what does adequacy mean? It says, check this out. This is important. It says, this code contains provisions that are considered necessary for safety, compliance therewith, and proper maintenance results in an installation that is essentially free from hazards, but not necessarily efficient, convenient, or adequate for good service or future expansion of electrical use. Do you get what that's saying? It is saying that it's essentially free from hazards, not 100% free from hazards, but essentially free. It's the, when people hear me talk about the NEC and I say it's a minimum safety standard, people freak out. And I think it's, it's one of those scenarios where when you say up, they want to say down. That just a natural reflex when an electrician or somebody says something, they want to say the opposite. They're not even sure why they want to be opposite. They just want to uh, disagree. As it said, if you follow this information that's in this code, Compliance with what's in this code and, of course, proper maintenance, ongoing taking care of electrical systems, then it will be essentially free from hazard. But that doesn't mean it's going to be efficient. That means you might have to do things that are like, oh, my God, why do I got to do this? 
What I gotta install all these freaking straps? It's not going anywhere. Why does the code say I can't run NMB in a raceway underground? It's not necessarily efficient. It's not necessarily convenient. And it might not be adequate for good service or future expansion. But it is compliant there within means it's going to be considered what? Essentially free from hazards. So the code doesn't care how efficient it is. The code doesn't care that you have to run something extra to make it safe. They don't care that you got to do a little bit more than normal to meet the compliance of this standard. It is what it is. And you just got to do it. Okay? Whether you like it or not. That's the code. Now, of course, states can amend things, modify things, change things. I kind of wish they wouldn't. Uh, but again, you can't write a code that is acceptable in every state because there's different climates, there's different applications, there's different soils. So I get it. Each, each jurisdiction will have their own little modifications. I, as much as I'd like to fight that, and when I worked at NEMA, that was one of my jobs to fight that, um, I, I do understand now, I don't understand when they remove stuff like GFCIs and we know they work and they just start modifying stuff because they just don't agree with something. Uh, then, then I, don't, uh, I don't agree with it. Now, if there's a, a geological reason or environmental reason or something like that, then okay. I, mean, I, can, I can buy on that. I can jump on board with that. But I can't just for any arbitrary reason just want to remove something just because people disagree. You're going to have to tell me why you disagree. You know what I'm saying? When I came to Texas, there was a bunch of them for North Texas. They had a bunch of amendments. And I started going to the North Texas meetings, and I started challenging them and challenging them. I mean, believe it or not, at one time, they didn't even adhere to the six disconnect rule. They let you have as many service disconnects as you want grouped in one location. And I was like, you know, the code says you're not to exceed six. And we had to explain why it was this way, and they finally changed it. But I mean, at the, end, at the end of the day, they didn't know and they were allowing things. Another thing they used to let you do is they would let you tie the MCs and things above a suspended ceiling. They let you tie them to the actual grid that supports the ceiling. And you can't do that. And 300.11. And, and we explained that the grids, typical grid, wasn't designed to handle that extra weight from those wiring methods connected to it and all that. And you have to use your own independent supports. and. And then they finally said, okay, I get it. I get it. Let's remove that. But they never had to put that in there to begin with. Somebody got it in there. The code didn't allow it, but they never pulled it out. So again, I'm not a big advocate for, for people making those kind of changes. But again, I get it. I get it. Every jurisdiction is different. They can make their amendments. I get it. All right. So adequacy, we already discussed it. So now there is an informational note here and it gives us a good opportunity to explain informational notes, although we will in a second. Uh, informational notes in the code are roadmaps. It's just great information. It's not enforceable. You can't get into an argument with an inspector over it and say, hey, this informational note says this and I'm going to do this. No, they're just information. Good information in most cases. And really does give you some insight and things to think about. But at the end of the day, it, that's all it is. It's just information. And it used to be we called these fine print notes. That's right. Because fine print note had some kind of legal context to it. Because if you've ever signed a legal document, there's always these little fine print notes and things like that. So the National Electrical Code's not a legal document until it's adopted by your jurisdiction or by your state and enforced. Somebody's got to back it, right? Until then, it's just a document that comes out by NFPA. That's it, right? So anyway, uh, informational notes, great information, but that's, you'll see the first informational note that you'll run into in the entire NEC as some trivia for you is 90.2B. Uh, you'll see some informational notes there. All right, and uh, that's just a trivia for the 2023. Anybody ask, what's the first informational note? Well, it's 90.2B after that informational note. All right, so the next thing is, again, we're talking about uh, uses and application, 90.2. In the 2023 edition, we now have what's called installations that are covered by this NEC. That's important. 
because there are certain things that aren't covered by the NEC, like utilities and other specific use that's exclusive to them. But there's certain things that are covered and there's certain things that are not. And there's no sense spending your time in the NEC on an application where the NEC isn't even germane to the installation. Okay? It can get frustrating, right? Now, under the 2020 edition, that was under 90.2, there was covered and not covered. Okay? So here, under the 2023, it's simple. It's under 90.2 now. Again, still under 90.2, but in this case, it's item C, and it's called installations covered. And we're going to look at them just really quickly. Um, now, they added the word installations to the word covered rather than just saying covered and not covered. Uh, so I guess so that you know what we're talking about. We're talking about installations, installations of electrical systems utilizing this code, whether or not this NEC or code is applicable or not. So what's covered? It says this code covers the installation and removal of electrical conductors, equipment, and raceways, signaling and communication conductors, equipment, and raceways, and optical fiber cables for the following. All right. So we go down and we look in it. There looks to be six items here. That was the same. There's, there was six in the 2020 NEC under 90.2A, but now it's uh, 90.2C. Number one, what is covered? Public and private premises, including buildings, structures, mobile homes, recreational vehicles, and floating buildings. Okay. They're covered under the NEC. Number two, Yards, lots, parking lots, carnivals, and industrial substations covered under the NEC. Number three, installations of conductors and equipment that connect to the supply of electricity. Okay, it's going to cover those conductors, whether it connects to the utility. It's going to cover it whether it connects to generators, flywheel applications, PV applications. It's going to cover all that. Okay, electricity. Uh, number four, installations used by the electric utility, such as office buildings, warehouses, garages, machine shops, and recreational buildings that are not integral part of generating plant substations and control centers. So if you have the PACO, you've heard us say PACO, P-O-C-O, that's the power company. So they have their production facility. Anything that's part of the generation, the substations or the control center that, that transmits or redirects power, that's not going to be covered under the NEC. That's exclusive to them. That's their control. Okay, and they know, they're, they know what they're dealing with. But they could have office buildings that are on that property. They could have warehouses for their equipment, their trucks, their garages, their machine shops, other things on the, the property they still would have to meet the NEC. So they've got to meet it for all their normal buildings. It's just the power production, the generating plant, where you'd have the big generators and, and any substations and, and, and the area around the substations or within that substation and all that kind of... Then, then that is not going to be under the, the scope of the National Electrical Code. But you know what? The office is where they take your orders and do all their administrative stuff. Absolutely has to be installed and inspected and everything normal under the NEC. Uh, number five, it says installation supplying shore power to ships and watercraft in marinas and boatyards, including monitoring of leakage current. So this most certainly talks about residential and commercial marinas, docks. Um, all the way down to shore power, right down there to the dock where the boats would come up and plug in. All of that right at the pedestals. It's not talking about the watercraft. It's not on the watercraft. They got their own rules they got to meet. But all the way down to the point where they come to the marina uh, and, and, or docks and whatnot, all of that is going to be covered by the National Electrical Code. And then number six um, was, is the installations... Um, used to export electric power from vehicles to premise wiring or for bi-directional current flow. So these are two that came in, five and six came in the National Electrical Code in the 2020 edition. So these aren't new. Um, and six is talking about EV vehicles. Um, it used to be the notion that we simply, you know, the premise would charge an EV vehicle, but now we have bi-directional. So a lot of these EV vehicles could even be used as standby power. 
and things like that. And they have other rules under 625 that the EV vehicles have to follow now, and they're expanding in their use, and everybody's all up and talking about how EVs are the next generation and yada, yada, yada. But, okay, I'm not sold on it. But anyway, we have the rules in 625 we have to follow. But bidirectional means it's not only charging, but it can also feed back into the premise. Okay? So all of those are covered by the NEC. So then that begs us to say, well, that sounds like pretty much everything, isn't it, Paul? What's not covered by the NEC? Okay, I got you. So here under D, that's 90.2D, it used to be 90.2B, but now it's 90.2D in the 2023 code, and it says installations not covered. Number one, installations in ships, watercraft, other than floating buildings, okay? Floating buildings are covered. We saw that in 90.2C, but, um, but in watercraft, you know, you're not going to, you're not going to use the NEC for any of the wiring inside of a watercraft other than a floating building, which is not really a watercraft, but they make it clear what it is. Um, railway rolling stock cars, uh, well, it just says railway rolling stock, uh, aircraft or automotive vehicles other than mobile homes and recreational vehicles, okay? So we have rules that we're going to cover 550, 551, and all that for motor homes, our mobile homes and recreational vehicles and what have you. But we're not talking about automobiles. That's the automobile industry, right? They got that covered, right? Okay. Next item that's not covered by the NEC, and this would be 90.2D2, would be installations underground in mines and self-propelled mobile surface mining machinery and its attendant electrical trailing cables. Not covered by the NEC. We have, there's the mining uh, codes that deal with the mining industry. It has nothing to do with what we do here in the National Electrical Code. This is just making it clear. Dude, they've got their own rules you got to follow. Okay? Underground and mines, things like that, <laughs> they got their own stuff they got to follow. Don't be trying to mix the NEC involved in that, okay? Now, that's not to confuse the uh, maybe above ground facilities that are around there, because then they would be normal buildings, commercial buildings, things like that. They're going to follow the NEC. This is specifically referring to the installations underground in mines, that type of thing. OK, uh, the next one would be item three it says installations of railways for generation, transformation Transmission, energy storage, or distribution of power used exclusively for operations of rolling stock or installations used ex exclusively for signaling and communication purposes. Okay, so not going to cover um, anything for uh, railways, anything to do with the generation, transformation, transmission, energy storage, or distribution power used exclusively for the operation of rolling stock or installations used, again, expressly for signaling and communication purposes. So it's not going to cover any of that. The next is installations of communication equipment under the exclusive control of communication utilities located outdoors or in building spaces used exclusively for such installations. So um, AT&T, if AT&T's complex, uh, you know, you, installations of communication equipment, this specific equipment that is under their exclusive control is not going to be covered by the NEC. But it also means that you could have a building with a room in that building that has nothing but communication equipment it's locked away. This is for the communication. That also, if it's the communication equipment, then that is not under the exclusive control. It's not going to be covered by the NEC. Now, you might have lighting in there and other things that would be covered by the NEC, but when it comes to their equipment under their exclusive control or even the space within the building that they might designate is that room is their exclusive control. Now, the thing about that is usually the room is probably already wired up under the commercial building, putting the lights in and whatever to the specs of the, the communication utility. And then once they take it over, they will then install their communication equipment and everything like that. So you got to watch how that works because the way this is read, really that space is within a building and it's exclusive to them. 
then they're really outside the scope of the NEC, what they do in there. But I'm just telling you from a jurisdictional standpoint, when I worked for jurisdiction, there was a communication room that was built in a large building up in Northern Virginia, and the electricians wired it to their specs, but they put the lighting in and the other before the communication company came in. And of course, if that was the case, before it was turned over to exclusive control, it got normal inspections as it normally would. Then once it was turned over, exclusive control of the uh, communication utility, then that was done. You didn't do anything else in that room. That was, that was theirs. That was their exclusive control. All right, the next one is item number five, and this is, says installations under the exclusive control of an electric utility where such installations, and you have an A, B, C, D. Yep. And the first one is A, it says consists of service drops or service laterals and associated metering. Okay, so the utility at the pole, they got their transformer, they're going to do a service drop down. That is, even though the funny thing about that is the National Electrical Code talks about clearances of service drops, but effectively that is outside the scope of the NEC. Now, if it's service entrance conductors overhead, then that's different. But service drops, even though we've got some guidance in the code, that's typically outside of the jurisdiction of the NEC. Okay? So um, you got to be Better be careful with that one. But again, that just says now same for the service lateral. So you could be coming from a meter up from a transformer on a pole running down a riser. And uh, that sounds like an oxymoron, right? A riser. And I said running down it. You get it because typically riser coming from the ground, rising up to the transformer. Anyway, you get what I mean. So it's coming down underground and it comes to the meter. And that would be a service lateral typically outside of the scope of the NEC. They got their own depth of cover they got to meet and follow their own rules in the National Electrical Safety Code. Now, if they happen to stop at a pedestal that's at the base of that pole, and now the electrician takes it from that pedestal to the meter, then that's different. That's going to be underground service entrance conductors, and that's going to be under the scope of the NEC. That's not a service lateral. That's why it's so important to read the definitions in Article 100 to learn the difference between service drop, service lateral, overhead service entrance conductors, underground service entrance conductors. All of them have a meaning. And it would behoove you to take a little time and read those different things, right? Um, now, the code does give us rules on the point of attachment. And so we have to make sure that even though they're bringing those service drops down, once we pick it up at the what's called the service point, that's when the NEC typically picks up, and then we have our clearances above grade and all this stuff, which obviously their drop has to be in a certain position in order to make sure we meet all that. So we have to make sure we extend a rise up if we have a weather head or whatnot. We have to make sure that we uh, extend that up on a mast to make sure that we can get that cover, even though the NEC is really not designed to cover what's under the exclusive control of the utility. It all works together and you all you end up having to meet all that stuff. So anyway, um, the meter, even though the electrician installs a meter for the utility, it's their exclusive control. They can tell you what they want in it, what they don't want in it. So it's their control. Once they take it, it's under their exclusive control. Number two or B, I should say, um, in the 2023 code, B, uh, 5B would be are on property owned or leased by the electric utility for the purpose of communications, metering, generation, control, transformation, transmission, energy storage, or distribution of electric energy. So out there at those substations, uh, any leased land, right-of-ways, all these types of things, actually right-of-ways will come up in a minute, but all of this property that's owned or it's actually leased from the electric utility, and it has to do with anything to do with communications, metering, generation, transmission lines. All that is under their scope. It's not something the NEC is going to cover. They know what they're doing. They know what they're putting their lines in. They know what they're That's all them. We don't have to worry about that as far as the NEC is concerned. C is are located in legally established easements or right-of-ways. So anything that they have of theirs that is located in these easements or any designated right of way 
is theirs. It's an exclusive control. It's outside the scope of the NEC. Uh, the next one is D, and it's rather lengthy. And I will tell you that it's the same information, pretty much, that was in the 2020 edition of the NEC under 90.2B. And this would have been item number five. Um, here it's just D under uh, 90.2. Uh, D, and it's just five. All right. And so let me read you D, uh, 5D. It says, are located by other written agreements, either designated by or recognized by public service commissions, utility commissions, or other regulatory agencies having jurisdiction for such installations. So in writing, they can give a certain area, a certain piece of land, a certain thing. They can give what's called written agreement. And if they do, they give a written agreement, then it's outside the scope of the NEC, right? Now, it goes a little deeper than that. It says, these written agreements shall be limited to installations for the purpose of. So when they write this agreement, they make an agreement to take a, a let's say, a, a piece of land or a location or something, and they need a written agreement then that written agreement is limited to installations for the purpose of communications, metering, generation, control, transformation, transmission, energy storage, or distribution of electric energy where legally established easements or right-of-ways cannot be obtained. So if the jurisdiction gives them and, and the utility can't do it right away or can't take an easement, but they need to do it, then they can seek written permission from the jurisdiction. The jurisdiction would give them written permission to be able to be on there. And if it's for any of these needs, and I don't know what other needs the, the uh, utility would have, if it's any other needs for those, then they get that written waiver and it's outside the scope of the NEC. Essentially, just like the easement, just like the right of way, but they're unable to get one. So they're issued a written permission, okay? A written agreement. And then, of course, it also goes on to see Native American reservations through the U.S. Department of Interior Bureau of Indian Affairs, military bases, land controlled by port authorities and state agencies and departments, and land owned by railroads, all of which are outside of the scope of the National Electrical Code. Now, it's kind of funny because like military bases, you're going to say at that point, do military bases have an AHJ, authority having jurisdiction? Absolutely. That could be the commander on the base. Ultimately, there's somebody's got to be held responsible. So, you know, just because it might something might not be in a jurisdiction, uh, like, you know, uh, Indian reservation. Well, the chief or whoever or the governing body, somebody's got to be responsible, right? Safe installations. Anyway, there's, a, there's an informational note under there explaining a lot of this, this stuff in case that's confusing for you. There's some good information uh, there to help you understand it a little bit better. And the next one is E which is relation to other international standards. Now, that used to be 90.1c, but now it's 90.2e. And it says, the requirements in this code address the fundamental principles to protection for safety contained in section 131 of International Electrotechnical Commission Standards 60364 one for low voltage electrical installations. That's the international code, by the way. So, so this is other international standards. People ask all the time. This is a, uh, a like an, uh, um, an IEC standard. IEC 60364-1 for low voltage electrical installations. Okay. And then F is the last one under 90.2, and that is special permission. And that was also in 90.2C of the 2020 edition. It's just now all been put under 90.2 ABCDEF under the 2023. 
And no significant change here. It just says the authority having jurisdiction for enforcing this code may grant, now check this, may grant exception for an installation of conductors or equipment that are not under the exclusive control of the electric utility and are used to connect the electric utility supply system to the service conductors of a premise served, provided such installations are outside a building or structure or terminate inside at a readily accessible location nearest the point of entrance of the service conductors. Okay. So again, by special permission, the AHJ, okay, um, that are charged with enforcing this code can grant exceptions for the installation of conductors or equipment that are not under the exclusive control of the utility. Okay. So uh, th that's special permission. Now, again, if, if, if the AHJ ever gives you or you seek special permission, uh, make sure you get that in writing because the approval for that or the special permission for that can sometimes disappear pretty quickly. I'm just saying. So make sure you get it. You're going to need it. You need to get it. All right. Next thing we're looking at is 90.3 code arrangement. Probably one of the more significant aspects of Article 90 because it kind of sets the roadmap for the National Electrical Code. 90.3. Code arrangement, it says this code is divided into introduction, which we're going over now, and nine chapters. As shown in figure 90.3, now there's a little figure there that kind of shows you how the code is broken up. It says chapters 1, 2, 3, and 4 apply generally. So chapters 1 being general, chapter 2 being wiring and protection, chapter 3 being wiring methods and material, and chapter 4 being equipment for general use. They're going to apply generally to every installation out there. Okay? So it's general. But then you've got chapters 5, 6, and 7. And what they're going to do is 5, for example, is special occupancy. Chapter 6 is special equipment. That's chapter 6. You know, you're familiar with things like swimming pools, EV in 625, swimming pools 680, PV in 690, right? So that's special equipment. And then you got chapter seven, which is special condition. And that's example like 725. You have different aspects of class one, class two, class three, things like that, right? So chapters one, two, three, and four apply generally throughout everywhere in the code. Five, six, and seven are designed to supplement or modify the requirements that are in chapters one through seven. So, yes, something in six can modify something in chapter two, for example. I'll give you the great example of this. So we have our grounding and bonding rules in Article 250. But when you get up into 680 for swimming pools, when we're talking about things like equipotential bonding, you get 680.26. And when you get there, you do things a little different. And that is because we're trying to establish equipotential bonding. We're not trying to clear any breaker. We're not trying to do anything but create a equipotential plane. That's it. But it's going to give you some things that might seem different than the principles you might see in uh, Article 250, which is in Chapter 2. So this is telling you when you're working in swimming pools, I can supplement or modify what would be in chapters one, two, three, four, five, six, or seven. So think about this. Chapters one through four applies generally. You have to apply them unless something in five, six, and seven will supplement the general rule or even modify the general rule. So that's how you think about it. Okay. So the next thing is chapter eight. And people ask me all the time, is eight enforceable? Absolutely. It's in the NEC. It says chapter eight covers communication systems and it's not subject to the requirements of chapters one through seven, except where the requirements are specifically referenced in chapter eight. So if chapter eight makes a reference to one of the other chapters, then the part that it's referencing is very much applicable, very specific, not the whole thing, just what it references. Other than that, Chapter 8 stand alone, baby, but it's got to be enforced. 
And then people tend to think that communication doesn't have to meet all these rules. It absolutely does. Whether it's network-powered broadband, whether it's uh, premise-powered broadband, whether it's coaxial, 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 whatever it is, all of that definitely has to meet the National Electrical Code. Even though it's in Chapter 8, it's still the code, okay? Still have to meet it. Now, again, if it makes reference to something specific in Chapters 1 through 7, then obviously that part that it references is very much applicable, right? That's a no-brainer, right? But 8 has its own rules you have to follow. Next, you've got Chapter 9. Chapter 9 consists of tables that are applicable as referenced. Okay, so you're going to have areas in the code that are going to make reference to Chapter 9, whether it's for raceway fill, uh, all those type of things. You're going to get a lot of conductor properties up there. Uh, chapter 9, Table 8 is where you get your circular mills. You're going to have references that get made to the tables that are associated with Chapter 9. Because of that reference, they are very much applicable okay so just remember that and then of course you have what's called informative annexes very good information uh a through k um a lot of good information not mandatory not a requirement kind of like an informational note that's why they call it informative very good info and if you're taking an exam buddy you need to be familiar with informative Annex D because that's a lot of calculations that, you know, could help you if you're struggling on an exam. Uh, if you want to look at the different UL standards, things like that, then you've got informative Annex A. Um, there's, there's torquing rules in there that mirror UL 486. Um, there's just so many things that are in that informative Annex. Um, you've got informative Annex C, which if you're doing raceway fill and all the conductors are the same size and you're not going to exceed 40% if you follow that table, right? If you've got different size conductors, then informative Annex C is not going to work for you. You're going to have to just use Chapter 9, uh, Table 4 and Table 5 and do a normal raceway fill calculation as you've learned in your apprenticeship program or learned in the field or maybe even learned in our Fast Tracks program. But if they're all the same conductors then remember, you could go to informative Annex C, and that following that is not going to, it means that you're not going to exceed the 40% requirement that you can't exceed 40% fill that's in Chapter 9, Table 1 of the NEC by just following informative Annex C, okay? And that's just for raceway fill. Now, that's not for a number of current current conductors. That's not for ampacity adjustment. That's just the fill requirement. That's it. It's kind of a shortcut. But all the conductors have to be the same size for that to work in informative Annex C. But I think you get the point. It's just good information. Shortcuts. Good, good information about the different standards. All those kind of things are there. Um, ADA. There's some information back there about ADA. If you're working on a building that's got ADA, ADA requirements for handicap accessibility and all that kind of stuff. There's some great information. Now, remember, that's just information. Typically, if the building requires ADA compliance, then that's going to be under the building code and everybody's going to already meet that. But again, just some good information. So remember, that's how these annexes are all about. All right. The next thing we're going to get to is arguably probably the most important thing, at least for inspectors, it is. And that is 90.4. Now, 90.4 in the 2020 edition of the National Electrical Code was only dealing with enforcement, right? Well, that is kind of changed when it came to the 2023 edition. So 90.4 is now dealing with A, B, C, and D. Okay, so this is for people that, that aren't familiar with it. You're kind of going to see the expansion here. So if you're looking at your... NFPA link, which I encourage all of you to go get. It's awesome. Um, you can see all the codes. You see the little notes that say this is new. And you'll start to see that this is expanded a little bit. And this is going to probably be something that the enforcement industry, the inspectors are just going to be tickled pink about. You know what I'm saying? Just tickled pink. And that is the expansion of enforcement. So A, the application. B, the interpretations. C, 
specific requirements and alternate alternative methods and D new products, construction and or materials. Now, this is not to say that these weren't kind of covered the way they were laid out in the previous edition, but I can tell you it was kind of all just lumped into 190.4, just kind of one big um, throw up, if you will, of content. So breaking it down into A, B, C, into these, these, these sub parts here, just kind of make it easier to understand, right? Okay, so let's look at each one of them. So the first one is application. So 90.4, you're going to probably see this on an inspection ticket where somebody says, oh, it's a violation, 90.4, but now they're going to be specific. 90.4A, B, C, or D. So A is application. It says this code is intended to be suitable for mandatory application of gov governmental bodies that exercise legal jurisdiction over electrical installations, including signaling and communication systems, and for use by insurance inspectors. Okay, so your AHJ, the state adopts the NEC, becomes a rule in their state, and this code is going to be a very, uh, okay, it's going to be intended as suitable for the, for the governmental body to use to determine compliance. Okay, so you're going to be able to use the NEC, and they, and they do anyway, by the way. So again, they're going to be using this for electrical installations, uh, but again, also covers signaling and communication systems, all of that, uh, which was already in the code before. That's not new. That's not new language. It's just structured a little different. So the next one is B. This is interpretations. It says the authority having jurisdiction for enforcement of the code has the responsibility for making interpretations of the rules for deciding on the approval of equipment and material and for granting the special permission contemplated in a number of the rules. All right, so let me talk about this for a second. I get a lot of people, whether it was on TikTok, which I'm not on TikTok anymore, by the way. I'm totally off that platform. So don't go looking for me on TikTok. You'll never see me on TikTok again. Um, so people say, you know, they, it's their job to make an interpretation. The problem is we need inspectors to not make an interpretation off of something they may have done in the past or their personal belief. They need to try to understand the intent of the NEC, that they can make an interpretation that is in line with this document and not just willy-nilly just making up stuff. Okay, that's my pet peeve, right? Just don't, uh, don't make up stuff. But when they say approval of equipment and material, a lot of times, if there's something that's, that's listed, they want to see the listing, they want to see the markings, uh, they'll ask you for the documentation, all those type of things, because they have to make an interpretation and, and let the installation go with these interpretations. And they're the ones that are charged with doing it, especially if the jurisdiction or the state adopts the NEC and they got to follow it. Somebody's got to be responsible for that. Okay, So they're the ones that are going to be doing that. Uh, C is specific requirements and alternative methods. Now, check this out. This says, by special permission, the AHJ, or the authority having jurisdiction, may waive, listen to this now, folks, may waive specific requirements in this code or permit alternative methods where it is assured that equivalent objectives can be achieved by establishing and maintaining effective safety. Now that's huge for an AHJ because they're the ones that are going to have to say, look, maybe something you're doing is not specific in the code, but when you look at it, it might be the only way you could have done something. And if you've done something in a way that we feel that maintains the effective safety, the, the desired effect of the scope of the NEC. Um, if you've done it, we'll give you special permission. And they're going to waive any specific requ requirement in this code, or they might allow you any um, alternative method. Now, why is that that important? So that's not totally new. I mean, that was in the 2020 edition. And this is why I tell people that's why it's so important 
for you to, to learn the next edition of the code even before your state adopts it. Why are you learning about 2023? Because there might be something that has changed from 2020 to 2023, and now it's not covered in 2020, but it was clarified or added in 20. So you might be able to seek special permission because it's going to meet the same objective, but it might be better. It might be clarified in the 2023, and you need to seek that special permission. And you seek that permission, and in many cases, it's just a modification. You pay a little fee. You, you're very specific about what you're modifying and what you're trying to do in the, in the next edition of the code. And, and the AHJ looks at it and goes, okay, I, I think you're using an alternate method, or I think that you're meeting the same equivalent objective, then I'm okay with it. And they have the power to do that. I mean, the, the goal is a safe installation, but we're not trying to reinvent the wheel here. So when you learn what the next edition has to offer, some things might have been clarified, expanded, uh, and now you get to take advantage of it by doing something like special permission. So don't just give up on it. There might be a, an avenue here for you to be able to do something that wasn't permitted in the 2020 because it was maybe ambiguous or wasn't clear, the inspector wasn't understanding it or you weren't understanding it. And now the 2023 makes it clear because we get better, more knowledgeable every cycle, then you can use that and try to seek special permission. You with me? So don't throw that one out. Don't throw that baby out with the bathwater. That might be one that helps you and your AHJ might be willing to work with you. And then when I was back in Virginia, we did modifications for things like this. All right, next one is D, it says new products, constructions, or materials. It says, this code may require new products, constructions, or material that may not yet be available at the time the code is adopted. In such event, the authority having jurisdiction may permit the use of the products, construction, or material uh, that comply with the most recent previous edition of the code adopted by the jurisdiction. What do we mean? Well, let's say that the 2023 code or even the 2020 code required something that wasn't necessarily available yet. One example is years ago when the code started requiring uh, or started allowing AFCI outlets, yet they weren't in the code yet, right? So, you know, problem with that is we had breakers that was already in there. So that really wasn't um, uh, that's probably not a great example, but if the code requires something and the market is not caught up with it yet, then it's going to say, well, look, I'll just let you revert back to the previous edition and do whatever it said to do during that one, because the new product or something is not out yet. And it's got into the code because that's kind of we always say the uh, the dog wagging the tail or whatnot. So you get it in the code, and but yet nobody has it to market yet. The code's requiring you to do something. Okay, well, you're going to have to go back to a previous edition in order to be able to make the jurisdiction happy. You see what I'm saying? So that's a, an example of when that might happen. All right, next we're moving to 90.5. Mandatory rules, permissive rules, and explanatory rules. A- B and C and D. Now, in the 2020 edition of the National Electrical Code, uh, same concept, it was 90.5, so that didn't change. Uh, and it was all the same. I don't see, there is a little bit of a change in C for explanatory material. But other than that, it's pretty much all the same as it was before. So we'll go over each one of them. All right, so A is called mandatory rules. And y'all are familiar with this, right? This is where you see the term shall and shall not. So this is not subjective, right? This is, this is a requirement. It says you shall do this or you shall not do this. These are mandatory rules, okay? It's not should I? No, these are shall rules. So here's what the code says. It says mandatory rules of this code are those that identify actions that are specifically required or actions that are specifically prohibited and are characterized by the use of the term shall or shall not. And it's telling you you shall not do this, 
you shall not do that, or you shall do this, or you shall do that. Those are mandatory rules. It's not a question. You've got to do it. You see those rules. You see that language. You just got to do it. Now, you have a B here, which is called permissive rules. Now, these permissive rules are saying, well, you don't have to do these, but you can if you want. So here's what permissive rules is. Permissive rules of this code are those that identify actions that are allowed. You're allowed to do it, but you're not required to do it. Okay? And normally used to describe options or alternative methods. Right? So a permissive rule, for example, would be we talked about with its the um, um, equipotential bonding around swimming pools. So to create that three foot, that equipotential bonding, you're given options here, right? Whether you're using the structural steel or whether or not you're using a copper wire or whether you're using a copper grid, okay? You get different options. You're permitted to use any one of those you want. Those are permissive, okay? So you've got options there. Now, the shall part is that you will be put in this perimeter. You will be put in this perimeter surface for this equipotential bonding grid. But permissive wise, we're going to give you three different options. Okay. Now it's characterized by use of the terms shall be permitted or shall not be required. Okay. So shall be permitted means eh, you can if you want. And shall not be required is like, dude, you can do it, but it's not required for you to do it, but you can do it. It's not going to hurt anything. So those are permissive rules. So you've got your mandatory and you got your permissive rules. Now, item number C is explanatory material. Now, this is important because a lot of times when we're going through this NEC, you're going to see things like informational notes. You're going to see informative annexes, things like that. And you're going to be looking at it and going, I get it. This is great information. This is roadmaps through the code. But can I fight an argument with it? Are this is requirements? And they are not requirements. They're just explanatory info. So let me read this to you and explain it. It says explanatory materials such as references to other standards. So it might give a reference to uh, some other standard that like, for example, healthcare facility is in FPA 99, but 517, it's going to give references over there to 99 because that's where a lot of the information is pulled from. That's just explanatory material. We're obviously not in NFPA 99, we're in NFPA 70, but again, just to let you know where that material comes from. Okay, so it's, on, or it says information related to a code rule is included in this code in the form of informational notes or an informational annex. It says, unless, now this is the new part in the code. It says, unless the standard reference includes a date the reference to be considered as the latest edition of the standard. So not really important for you to know what that means, but anytime you see an informational note and it'll have a specific standard that it's referencing, uh, it'll put a date, which is the latest published date of that referenced material. And if for some reason it doesn't have a date, this is kind of the way the code doesn't want to keep changing these things because it's hard for everybody on the panels for NFPA 70 to keep track of all these other standards and when they change. So rather than put these dates everywhere and then you'll get it wrong when we get together and have these meetings, just reference the standard and then put no date on it and then put this in here and say, oh, we're, we're just talking about whatever the latest edition is. That's fine. It doesn't matter. And so that's what this is saying. It just saves a lot of potential standards that we reference that are the wrong edition. Like we might reference a 2014 edition, but really the latest one might be the 2020 edition of another standard. Well, we don't want to reference the 2014 if the latest one's the 2020. Still the same standard. So without putting a date on it, it just it cleans all that mud up. You with me? Now it also goes on to say such notes are informational only and are not enforceable as required requirements of this code. Absolutely not. Informational notes or even informative annexes are not enforceable by the HJ. So if you ever see that on an inspection ticket, you need to go hold your horses there, Slick. You can't fail me for that. And I know somebody's out there going to say, the inspector can fail you for anything. Well, not without a fight, because I'm going to fight that one. I'm just saying. All right. It goes on and says, 
brackets containing sections, references to other NFPA documents, like I said, NFPA 99, are for informational purposes only and are provided as a guide to indicate the source of that extracted text. These bracketed references immediately follow the extracted text. Okay, so for example, I gave you NFPA 99, it's the healthcare facility. So in 517, there's a lot of information that's verbatim comes straight from NFPA 99 because it is germane to Article 517, right? So when they drop it in there, they put the bracket after it to let you know which standard it comes from in FPA 99. And it might, you know, in, in that way, you know exactly where it was extracted from. Okay. So that's why they do it. Uh, last one is D and that is informative annexes. And as you expected, same concept. It says non-mandatory information relative to the use of the NEC is provided in informa informative annexes. Informative an annexes are not part of the enforceable requirements of the NEC, but are included for information purposes only. And they are a wonderful resource in the code. If you're taking an exam, like I said, informative annex D can be a lifesaver. If you've got brain fart and you just can't remember something in a calculation, you go there and it might just jog your memory. And it's right there. It's in the code. So make sure you check them out. Again, not enforceable, but just some good old information there. All right. Next is 90.6. Formal interpretation. What does that mean? Okay, it says to promote uniformity of interpretation and application of this code, formal interpretation procedures have been established and are found in the regulations governing the development of the NFPA standards. So there is a handful of interpretations that have been argued, and once they become published, they're, they're there. You can go see them and read them. Uh, most people, when they say they contact NFPA, because if you're a member of NFPA, you can request an informal interpretation. It's informal. It's just their opinion. And it's no different than your opinion and somebody else's opinion. They're just pretty darn knowledgeable folks over there at NFPA. So they have an opinion. Um, I mean, no different than me giving you an opinion. It's not a formal interpretation. It's an opinion interpretation. And they make sure you know that because there's a heavily amount of waivers on the email saying you do know that this is just an opinion of the individual writing this response. But there are formal interpretations and there is a process. If you want to go through all the hoops to get a formal interpretation of it, you can do it. Just go get the regulations that are governing the development of the NFPA standards and you'll see a process for you to submit it. And it's a process and once it's established, then you'll get a formal interpretation and it usually be available on NFPA's website and usually in the printed versions of the NEC. There's usually the, the formal interpretations in there if you have any. Okay. But just want you to understand that there's a lot of informal interpretations out there. And again, if they come from a very reliable source, then they can be very beneficial. Okay. But there's a difference. All right. 90.7. 90.7 is examination of equipment for safety. All right now, it was 90.7 in the 2020, so no significant change here. Uh, but you know, it was just you know we're, we're back to the normal flow, the same as it was in the 2020. Examination of uh, equipment for safety. It says. For specific items of equipment and materials referred to in this code, examinations for safety made under standard conditions provide a basis for approval where the record is made generally available through promulgation by organizations properly equipped and qualified for experimental testing, inspections of the run of goods at factories, and service value determination through field evaluations. This avoids necessity. Now, this is important. Listen, folks. Now, basically, to this point, it's saying, look, equipment based on a third party NRTL, it gets evaluated. It gets done. It gets listed. It gets labels put on it. It gets all this stuff 
to tell you that this equipment is safe, right? And then it says, okay. And, and it even says you can do field evaluations from field evaluating bodies. Maybe you have some equipment that comes in from overseas um, and it has to be evaluated. All that stuff. Once it gets done, it's saying, look, it's, it's been done, Mr. Inspector. It's already been evaluated. That's when now it goes in and says this. It says, this avoids, now listen to me here, this avoids the necessity for repetition of examinations by different examiners, frequently with inadequate facilities for such work and the confusion that would result from conflicting reports of the suitability of devices and materials examined for a given purpose. We're not here to reinvent the wheel. If I get a panel from Eaton Cutler Hammer or I get one from Schneider and it's a UL67, it has all, I am not going to reinvent the wheel here. I am not going to try to inspect it and calculate that bus and all that internal, that, that's all been evaluated already. I'm not. I'm not going to relook it up. Okay. And it, it, this repetition, and they don't usually, I mean, the manufacturer is designed for this. I mean, they have a usually an in house quality control department and they do all this stuff. So I, we don't want to reinvent the wheel here. And this is basically telling you that, telling the inspector, dude, we don't need to reinvent the wheel here. Okay. Now it also goes on to say, look, it is, it is the intent of this code that factory installed internal wiring or the construction of equipment need not be, check this out, need not be inspected at the time of installation of the equipment, except to detect alterations or damage if the equipment has been listed by a qualified electrical testing laboratory that is recognized as having the facilities described in the preceding paragraph and that requires suitability for installation in accordance with this code. Suitability shall be determined by application of requirements that are compatible with this code. Hey, look, what are we saying? Mr. Inspector, it's already comes listed. Everything is in part of it. The panel board is installed in the cabinet. Everything's already in there. If there's any internal wiring to a piece of equipment, like switch gear has internal wiring, all this is inherent with the equipment. Don't need to reinvent the wheel here. It's fine. Don't start trying to say, well, it, you know, a good example of this would be the green ground screw. We don't need to reinvent the wheel here. If it's got a main bonding jumper in there, it's a green ground screw. It's considered adequate. It gets evaluated. It's listed for use of service equipment. Everything is done. I'm not going to try to reevaluate that. It's done. It's a great example of that. Okay. NRTLs, NERDLs, nationally recognized testing laboratories, all that. They go through a process. There's tons of them. NFPA, excuse me, not NFPA. Um, UL, oh, I said NFPA. UL, um, you've got CSA, you've got Intertech, you've got MET. You've got a bunch of different ones, right? And they don't all do all standards, but, you know, the one that does the most probably is Intertech and UL, they probably do the most, but they're all equivalent third-party evaluation bodies, right? NRTLs, Nationally Recognized Testing Laboratories, okay? All right, so there you go. That's what we're saying is don't reinvent the wheel. If you get a piece of equipment, it comes and everything's in it. Don't start nitpicking it apart. It's fine. Now, if there's damage to it, you see damage, you see breakers that are cracked, you see something, that's different. You can evaluate it. You can look at it. You can say, wait a minute. But other than that, looks fine. I mean, don't reinvent the wheel here. All right, 90.8, wiring planning. Now, this one is broken into an A and a B. And in the um, 2020 edition, it was also an A and a B as well. So... And it didn't look like there's any, there's any change to this. So A is future expansion and convenience. Now, this is interesting. I want to read this to you, and I want you to understand, because some people probably have never looked at 90.A. You notice it says future expansion and convenience. And you're thinking, oh, here we go. Here we go. 
Code's going to tell us what we got to do for future expansion. It's going to tell us what we got to do for convenience and yada, yada, yada. Okay, here's what it says. Plans and specifications that provide ample space in raceways, spare raceways, and additional space allow for future increases in electric power and communication circuits. Distribution centers located in readily accessible locations provide convenience and safety of operations. So when I read this one to people, and I'm going to be totally honest with you, anytime I read this one and I look at it, I look at somebody and I say, you know what? No shit. I mean, obviously, if you size your raceway, you have spare raceways, and it, it kind of tells you to think about these things for future expansion and things like that for convenience. Okay? It, you know, put your distribution panels in a way that you know they're going to be readily accessible. That's a no-brainer. We got to do that in, anyway, 110.26, all those type of things. So it doesn't really tell me anything more for that. It's just saying, hey, just think smart. Think smart a little bit. Next is B. It says number of circuits in enclosures. It says it is, it, is else, um, it is elsewhere provided in this code that the number of circuits confined in a single enclosure be varyingly restricted. Limiting the number of circuits in a single enclosure minimizes the effects from a short circuit or ground fault. So when it talks about this, we have different rules in the code for filling a cross-sectional area. We have rules for wireways. We have rules for auxiliary gutters. We have all different types of rules for not filling more than the cross-sectional area of a certain space uh, in, in panels. And we have all these rules. And this is just reminding us that the rules are there to limit the number of conductors in there. You're not jamming them in there. You're not forcing them in there. You're not uh, putting them in a situation where it raises the, the issue of potential short circuit or even ground faults because of you uh, filling up the space and not have adequate space to, to put these conductors in, these circuits. So this is just a reminder. I tell people all the time that 90.7, or excuse me, 90.8 to me, is just kind of saying, okay, big boy, before you start wiring, before you start working, remember, follow the equipment's rules, understand your space, think about future expansion, and put the equipment where it's easy to get to it so you don't have to breach all these other rules in 110.26 and all this for working clearance. Just be smart, and you'll be okay. That's what 90.8 is for me. Now, you might feel differently, but that's how I feel about 90.8. All right. Last one we're going to cover today is 90.9, units of measurement. And that is broken down into A, B, C. And if you look in the 2020 edition, units of measurement was A, B, and C. And it looked like there was a, well, there's A, B, C, and D, excuse me. And it looks like that's the same way for the 2023. The only difference is under C, it seems that it was broken down where it says permitted use of soft conversion. It looks like it was one, two, and three, and four previously. And it looks like it was the same. Looks like it was the same breakdown. Okay. We might as well go over it because I don't see any significant change in here. Okay, so let's go on it. So it's 90.9 units of measure. We'll start with A. It says measurement system of preference. All right, so the, for the purpose of this code, the NEC, what we're working on, it says metric units of measurement are in accordance with the modernized metric system known as the International System of Units, which is abbreviated as SI. Okay? So that is the system measurement of preference. If you look in the NEC and you wonder, for example, when you're doing securing and supporting and whatnot, it always seems to want to give you millimeters or meters first. And then, of course, in parentheses, it gives you the uh, things like um, inch pounds or feet thing. That's kind of this uh, 
what we call uh, an imperial method, right? Uh, they were familiar with feet and inches and all that stuff. But the, if you'll notice that the code gives us the um, what's called international system of units, that's SI first. You can use either or, and of course we'll talk about that. We always tend to use feet and inches and whatnot, but you could use millimeters, metrics, you know, the meters and things like that. And that's the measurement system of preference. I don't know why, to be honest with you, somebody might know out there, and I'm sure they do. Um, people will say because of international codes, but you know what? I don't give a damn about the international codes. I'm in the U.S., and I think we probably use, uh, more often than not, we use inch-pound units, uh, things like that. So, again... I don't know why, but it is what it is, okay? But anyway, just so you know, they're called International System of Units, SI, and it's called the Modernized Metric System. And that's why you see the millimeters and meters and all that first. All right, so next is B, and B is called the Dual System of Units. SI units shall appear first. We just talked about that, so that is your measurement system of preference. I don't know why somebody does. I'm sure NFPA knows why, but that's what we use. And even though you and I both know we use feet and inches and whatnot. But anyway, SI unit appears first, and then the inch-pound units shall immediately follow in parentheses. Okay? It says, conversion from inch-pound units to SI units shall be based on a hard conversion, except as provided in 90.9C. Now, that's where you're going to be permitted to use what's called soft conversions so any other time you would be it would be a hard conversion so whatever it is in a hard conversion whatever inch pounds are you would convert it to si units and that would be a hard exacting conversion and there's kind of a soft version of that just like eh, it's not exact it doesn't have to be exact that type of thing okay all right so anyway just want, what I want you to take away from that part is you're going to have two different systems there. You're used to seeing it. The first one's the SI, kind of a metric system, modernized metric system. And then, of course, you have what's called, we refer to it as the inch-pound units. Uh, I like to say imperial, um, but that's where you get the feet and things. And that's, I think, what we use the most. That's probably what we encounter in the field on exams and Again, but I do want you to know that's why they're both there, and that's why one is before the other, because that's con one is considered the preferred method, but you know we're not. We're going to probably use the inch-pound units. All right, so I guess the first thing we should talk about is, I guess I should explain what a, what a hard conversion is, because we, we have to do a hard conversion. That's a choice, but we're going to be permitted to do soft conversions. But what's a hard conversion? Well... I guess one of the examples of, a, of convert is when maybe we're converting inches into millimeters, right? And I'm taking it and multiplying it by 25.4. Now, then we end up rounding off to the nearest degree, okay, for precision. So in the National Electrical Code, for example, we might have something that is in working space and it might have something that says the height wise, let's say six and a half feet. And then approximately the equalness to that is 1.981 meters. Well, a hard conversion to that would be taking that 1.981 meters and rounding it up to 2.0. That's a hard conversion, okay? Not taking a soft value, but literally saying, no, that's six and a half feet. It's approximately 1.981, where we're not going to have that. We're going to make you round it up to 2.0. That's a hard conversion. Hard stance, round up. A soft conversion is kind of like uh, an approximate, uh, approximate value. It is, again, one of the things you have to think about is when would we do, when would you have an example of a soft conversion? Well... You could, example, you could convert one inch to millimeters and get 25.4 millimeters to one inch. Now, but table four, and if you're looking at it in, in table four, you see that EMT, for example, it tells us that one inch trade size EMT conduit is actually 1.049 inches. 
in the internal diameter. Well, that 1.049 inches internal diameter, that actually equates to 26.6 millimeters, okay, as shown in the same table, right? And for those that aren't familiar with it, I probably should say, if you go to chapter nine, table four, and you look at EMT, which is article 358, just the very first one you'll run into, you'll see that you got over two wires, you got 60, you got one wire 53%, two wires at 31. Then you have what's called nominal interior diameter. And we're talking about trade size one. And if you go down there, you'll look and you'll see again in inches, it's 1.049, okay? So that tells you, so what would that translate to in millimeters? Well, it says right there, 26.6 millimeters. And it's right there in the table, okay? But the metric trade size for a trade size one, if you look to the left, you'll see that one equates to 27. That's the metric designator but it says trade size one next to it. But if you look at the millimeters internal diameter, you see that it says 26.6, right? So it's not 26.6, it's actually metric designator is 27, okay? So what you're doing is you're saying, okay, you're converting that trade size one to a trade size 27 millimeters. And the, the math is not exact. And that's okay. That's a soft conversion. It's saying, I know it's not an exact number, but we're going to tell you where that you can do that under 90.9C. We're going to say where it's okay to do this soft conversion because it's not exact. Whereas a hard conversion is like, again, six and a half feet. The approximate value that's the same in meters is 1.981. Well, that's not good enough. If it's a hard conversion, you're going to round that thing up to 2.0 meters. But there are certain areas where we will let you do a soft conversion. And this just happens to be one of them when you're looking at raceways. You get me? It's 26.6 millimeters. But then when you look at the metric designator, it's 27. It's not exact. It's an approximate but we're okay with that soft conversion, okay? Okay, that's, that's the first part every people you know, have to, to get their head wrapped around when it comes to soft conversion versus hard conversion, okay? In the code, you're gonna be required to do a hard conversion everywhere except where you're permitted to do soft conversions based on uh, 90.9C here, and you have a one, two, three, and four. And they're different types of soft conversions. Okay, the very first one's basically what we just did on an example of Raceway. But we'll go over each one of them. But I just wanted you to get an understanding of a of soft conversion versus hard conversions. All right, so let's go on and jump on in then to see and kind of read it and get a, we or you already know that we're going to use hard conversion except we're allowed in 90.9C. So let's look at it. Permitted use of a soft conversion. Um, it says the cases given in 90.9 C1 through C4 shall not be required to use a hard conversion and shall be permitted to use soft conversion. Okay, so number one, trade sizes. We just saw that it says where the actual measured size of the product, in this case was the internal diameter of the actual uh, raceway, uh, is not the same as the nominal size or the trade size designator, in this case 27, versus trade size one, 27, and we saw what the actual millimeters were. So basically this is saying, look, the raceway was only 1.049, and in millimeters that was 26.6. Well, this is actually in inches, it's more than one inch, or trade size one, but it is less than the millimeter designator of 27 because this is 26.6. So we'll let you use a trade size one, considered it, and again, that's a soft conversion. It's not a direct hard conversion like we did an example of six and a half feet. Again, like the headroom requirements in 110.26 and all that kind of stuff. So that's a soft conversion. Probably something you don't need to worry about. You just follow the code, but uh, at the end of the day, that's what that one means. Uh, the next one, number two, is extracted material. It says where material is extracted from another standard, means I pull it out of something else, 
It says the content of the original materials shall not be compromised or violated. Any editing of the extracted text shall be confined to making the style consistent with the NEC. So style manual changes, anything we might pull out of like NFPA 99 for healthcare, um, we're going to put that in the NEC. We'll massage it to our uh, style manual. But as far as the main information, we're going to put it in the code and we're going to give reference to that standard in the brackets, uh, as we talked about earlier. And we're okay with that. We, we can, we'll use what's from the other document. That's not a problem. The next is industry practice. It says where industry practices to express units in inch pounds, the inclusion of SI units shall not be required. So if it's a general practice where we're used to putting something or something is usually done in, in inches and feet and that's okay, then if that takes place, we don't have to give the SI units. If it's customary due to industry practice, to just give it in feet or inches or whatever, that would be part of the inch pound units, then that's okay. If that is standard industry practice to do that, then we're okay. And then the last one is safety. It says where a negative impact on safety would result, soft conversion shall be used. So let me give you an example here. So I'm supposed to use a hard conversion all the time. However, if doing a hard conversion actually creates a negative impact on safety because of the hard conversion, how we have to round it up and do something like that, if doing so has a negative effect, then we're okay to use a soft conversion, which is more of an approximation. You with me? If, the, if doing a hard conversion forces us to go into a situation where the safety is diminished, then we get to ignore that hard conversion and go with the soft conversion. And for the life of me, I, I, I know I'm not thinking of any, uh, anywhere that I can think of that, but somewhere that would say you can't get within, um, you, you can't get within a certain distance to something and a hard conversion would change that to where you're going to violate it and it becomes an unsafe condition then you can go with the soft conversion, right? That's the best example I'm gonna give you because at the time of recording this, for the life of me, I can't think of an example here. I'm sure other people will. But just remember, if the hard conversion resulted in something that negates safety, then you're able to use a soft conversion in order to be able to meet the code. All right, in compliance, D, Last one, it says conversion from inch pound units to SI units shall be permitted to be an approximate conversion. Okay, compliance with the numbers shown in either the SI system or the inch pound system shall constitute compliance with this code. Um, I'll give you an example of this. So if something says that I have to secure something within four and a half feet, if the four and a half feet is the inch pound units and it's equivalent meet millimeters or whatever the distance, you know, say I have to secure something within 12 inches, but the equivalent millimeters isn't a direct conversion to 12 inches. That's okay. I can use either one I want as long as it doesn't impact safety. If it's just compliance with like securing and supporting, then I can use either one that I want. So I can use the, the, the SI, or I can use the inch pound method, okay? Either one. And it might behoove you to understand the differences in two, right? So I'm just, I'm just saying, knowing the difference here for compliance, because of how they're written in the code, I can use either or. I can use the SI, or I can use the inch pound units, okay? Metric or pound units, either one, or I like to say imperial units. Any, either one is okay as far as meeting compliance with the National Electrical Code, okay? All right, and there is an informational note here and why I do not usually read all of these. I will read this one because it is a good informational note and it is informational note number one and it says, Hard conversion is considered a change in dimensions 
or properties of an item into a new size that might or might not be interchangeable with the sizes used in the original measurement. Okay, remember rounding up. Six and a half feet doesn't equate exactly to the uh, an even metric value. So you're going to hard conversion would be rounding up. So 6.5, like 2.0 meters, that type of thing. Um, it goes on to say soft conversion is considered a direct mathematical conversion and involves a change in the description of an existing measurement, but not in the actual dimension. Okay. Sounds real confusing, isn't it? So much better to just say whatever and, <laughs> and just use the inch pound units and stick with your feet and your pounds and move on, right? Okay. Uh, but there is an information on note number two that tells you what standard to go look at if you want to get more information on uh, use of the international system of, of units, the SIs, uh, the modern metric system, that's ASTM SI10. And that's the 1997 edition. Obviously, they hadn't updated that in a while. No need to, I guess. But anyway, there you go. So that's kind of an overview of 90, uh, Article 90. Um, so hopefully you got something out of that. Picked up a little bit of something today. A little bit longer podcast than normal, but hopefully you got something out of it. And you made it through the end. Hopefully you made it through the end. So till next time, folks, stay safe. God bless. And hope you got something out of it. Take care.